If you're looking for murder, I know a guy who can get it for you wholesale. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar to West Coast Underwriters, San Francisco branch, attention Bradford L. Coates, general manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of uh, the little man who wasn't all there, or in most cases, there at all, or the unpaid premium payoff. Expense account, item one. Three cents postage due on your airmail special delivery letter containing said assignment. I can just hear you dictating it. Take a letter. To Johnny Dollar, you'll find his address in the files. Dear sir, better make that dear Dollar. Enclosed find copies of letters received by us from one Mr. James Yarbo, period. This man's wife was insured with our company until recently. One day before her death, her period of grace and an unpaid premium ran out. We canceled her policy in the amount of $20,000. Her husband, Yabo, first made every effort to collect, then threatened us. Since then, we've received the enclosed series of letters intimating, without confessing, that he's had a hand in the accidental death of at least 12 of our policyholders to date. The police have been working on it, but are getting nowhere. If you are available, please come immediately. Uh, uh, yours very truly, uh, so far. Expense account, item two, $176.87. Airfare, Hartford to San Francisco. Item three, 540. Cab fare, airport to your office. Dollar, glad you got him. You've no idea what okay, a mess this whole thing is. Okay, Mr. Coates, okay, don't get excited. We'll nail this guy before you run out of policyholders. Well, the dozen he's apparently done away with already have cost us darn near a quarter of a million. You've got to move fast, Dollar. The man is a homicidal maniac. Yeah, but a smart one, though. He's put just enough in those letters to, he sent you to let you know that he's working on a grand-scale revenge against your company. But he leaves out just enough so the law can't lock him up. He's had perfect alibis in every case. Uh, look, uh, Mr. Coates, tell me, have all these deaths been local right around here? No, they've been all over California. Mm-hmm. Well, one other thing, the method. From this list you gave me, Mr. Yarbo seems to have a preference for killing people through the noisy and gory method of fake automobile accidents. Yes, very true. But what about this last one? Airplane crash. That was a $30,000 loss to us. Uh, just think. Our poor, innocent policyholder flying around and then his engine quit. Thanks to a man he's never even seen. Tell me, Mr. Coates, <sighs> just how difficult would it be to get a list of your California policyholders? Names and addresses, you know. Why, that would take days. But goodness gracious, man, you can't hope to keep an eye on them all. Besides, the minute you went off the job, he'd strike again. That's a preposterous Whoa, idea. Cut time. Look, I don't want the list. I was just wondering how Yarbo got it. Oh. Now, so far you've given me nothing to go on. I'd like you to add two things to that. Yarbo's home address and a $50,000 life insurance policy made out to me. What on earth is that for? Well, look, in the first place, if we're going fishing for Mr. Yarbo, I might as well be the worm. In the second place, if I should get gobbled up in the line of duty, that $50,000 life insurance would make several attractive young ladies of my acquaintance very happy. Not, mind you, as happy as I can make them by remaining alive. Expense account, item four. $30. Rental of limousine complete with chauffeur. I figured if I was riding the trouble, I was riding in style. So I started on a house-to-house -house survey. You might say... Knocking at death's door. Hey, thank you for being here. What's your Yes. What is it, the police? Oh, I'm sorry to bother you, Mrs. Chianelli, but I'm from the insurance company. Oh, yes. It'll only take a moment. One question about your son. Oh, poor Angelo. What do you want to know about my poor son? He'd drive away in his automobile. That's all. 
I'll never see him in life again. Yes, I, I, I know. Uh, tell me, Mrs. Chianelli, did you ever hear your son mention a man named Yarbo? Yarbo? Yeah. Yarbo. I don't know about no such Yarbo. Not please. Please deliver me. There was so much sadness in my house. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Dykes? Yes. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm from the insurance company. About your son's plane crash. Oh. I thought all those details had been taken care of. But just one thing, Mr. Dykes. Did your son ever mention a man named Yarbo? Yarbo? Yeah. That's an unusual name. I'm sure if he had, I would have remembered. Okay, sir. I'm sorry to bother you. And thanks. <laughs> Yes, sir. May I help you? Yes, I'd like to have a word with Mrs. Weatherly. I'm from the insurance company. Well, sir, Mrs. Weatherly has been indisposed, not receiving visitors. What is it, Brian? Uh, How do you do, Mrs. Weatherly? My name is Johnny Dollar. Oh, dear, dear. Uh, You may go, Brian. Oh, I'm ashamed to let you see me in this condition, Mr. Dollar. Just ashamed. But you understand. I I do indeed. It was bad enough. The accident, I mean. But the scandal! Oh, oh, I'll never be able to hold my head up again. Yes, Uh, no. If Harvey had to get himself in an automobile accident, why, oh, why, I ask you, did he have to have that awful Mrs. Barclay in the car? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, it was very unthoughtful of him, Uh, Mrs. Weatherly. Would you mind answering one question? Well, if I can. Did your husband ever mention a man named Yarbo? Well, no. No, he never mentioned a man named Yarbo. But neither did he ever mention Mrs. Barclay. I tried a half a dozen of the other beneficiaries left behind by Mr. Yarbo's list of victims. All I got out of it was a very watery afternoon. The tears were falling like monsoon time in Burma. But of information, I got none. This brought me right smack up to a point I didn't want to have to reach. The point of contacting Mr. Yarbo in person. At 8.30 that night, I took a plan on Yarbo's house on Lombard Street. At 11.30, I saw the lights go out, as did Yarbo. He was a little guy, stooped over like he was looking for cigarette butts on the sidewalk, needing a haircut, and through to type, wearing a long black overcoat. But worst of all was the little satchel he was carrying... Items like this always set off a chain reaction in my imagination, and I could just see him on his way to atomizing the Oakland Bay Bridge, thus causing the biggest automobile accident in history. I very cleverly forced my way into the house by breaking a first-floor window, reaching in and opening same. Cyclops' eye of my flashlight started picking up information on the subject of Mr. Yarbo immediately. The room I had entered looked like the Hobby Lobby of an English Bobby, a crime museum if I ever saw one. On one wall, a gun case. On another, a crime library. And scattered around the room, a grisly collection, ranging from blood-stained hatchets to shrunken heads. But the most surprising criminal curio of all stood right behind me. Mr. Yarbo, complete with little black bag. Well, well, I must say, the current second story man dresses well, but I must also say you, my man, must have the old masters of the art turning in their graves. For you, young man, are a heavy-fingered bungler. Sir, let's have a better look at you. Now, that flashlight, I'll feel better after you've dropped it. Hey, what am I doing? You're not even pointing a gun at me. Don't feel too comfortable, You are well covered from many points. A step from you in any direction may detonate any number of explosive devices. Uh, Why did I have to pick this joint to burgle? I feel like a city councilman playing a call in the White House. You seem more the kind of a guy I should be working for instead of on. What's your racket? Racket? You were in a racket, my little friend. My pastime is a science. Yes, I I take it you are impressed with my collection. Uh, uh, who, Who wouldn't be? Well... If you're interested, 
Come here. Uh, about those booby traps. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. Note well the design of the rug. The large roses. Avoid stepping on them for the time being. Oh, great. And I was in here stumbling around in the dark. May your good luck continue. But look, look here in this case, the small vial on the right. That was purloined for me to order from the famous Black Museum in Scotland Yard. That little vial once rested in the case of the fabulous murderer, Dr. Crippen. And there, beside it, that lock of hair, mm-hmm. that is from the head of the second victim of the noted mass murderer, Neil Creeve. And up there, look up there, the hangman's noose over the mantle, from that one swung the body of the notorious Western bad woman, Fanny Turner. Oh, uh, how's chances for running this place for Halloween? Well, well, all right, then, since you no longer seem interested in playing the part of a bungling burglar, then I assume that I am also free to discontinue my pose as a victim of your disguise, Mr. Johnny Dollar. Oh, ah, looks like the chips are down and I'm the fish. Yes. And there are a lot of other fish in your sea, Mr. Dollar. Poison eels, that's what you are, the lot of you. Parasites, gambling on death, and then not paying when you lose. Uh, listen, Mr. Yarbo, you're placing a big hunk of blame where it doesn't belong. You're confused about things. Confused? Yes. When your wife's insurance premium was overdue, you were allowed a 30-day period of grace. And when that went by, the policy was canceled. Now, that's not the insurance company's fault. It was your fault. But it wasn't. I gave her the money. She spent it on herself. I'd have made it up. I told them so after she died. I told them, but they wouldn't listen. I'll show you. I'll show you. The Arbo looked like he was headed to show me the chopping end of an axe laying on top of a small table. I hit him just as he hit the table. As he hit the floor, I noticed what I was standing on. One of those big red roses in the carpet. It hadn't exploded yet, but that was one flower I wasn't standing around waiting to see bloom. It took a lot of nerve picking up a telephone in that room. But I finally got a good hold on my nerves and a fair hold on an imitation of Yarbo's voice. Took one deep breath and picked up the phone. Yes? Hello, James. This is Martha. I'm at the office. I have good news. Two more. Mr. and Mrs. Granville Morse, killed tonight on the Great Highway, two miles south of Seal Rock, 8.45 tonight. Ran into a post, both killed. Insured for a total of 80000 I gotta go now. Goodbye, Jane. Well, congratulations, Brother Yarbo. Two more at 8.45 tonight. And who's your new alibi? Me. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, did you ever think of and as a comedy word? Maybe not, but you'll get a full demonstration on CBS this Wednesday night. There'll be Groucho Marx and his guest on that hilarious quiz, You Bet Your Life. For it's the guests who sometimes floor Groucho with their wisecracks. There'll be Bing Crosby in his regular Wednesday night CBS show and his special guest, Bob Hope. There'll be George Burns and Gracie Allen and Bill Goodwin. And, and becomes more filled with comedy when you tell or learn that Lum and Abner will have their premiere as Wednesday night regulars on most of these same CBS stations. Yes, this fall, you hear them all on C and B and S. Now, with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The Arbo might have been lying unconscious on the floor, but in that setting, I was still afraid of him. I'd have looked the place over with a fine tooth comb, only having none, I used my hands. I put the pat test to Yarbo's pockets for a gun. He was unloaded. Then turned my attention to the little black bag he'd been carrying when I saw him leave the house, and which he still had with him when he returned. I hoped it wasn't booby-trapped. Opened it and discovered that it was a trap, the type my kind of booby stepped into. Inside the bag was a small radio receiver tuned to something I looked for and found in the room. A small radio transmitter of the type formerly used in army tanks. 
Through this, Yarbo had heard me enter his little museum of murder and had returned to catch me in the act of prowling the premises. About then, I caught him in the act of coming to. Well, welcome home, Yarbo. Time to get up. I just had a long chat on the phone with Martha. She thought I was you. You think you're very clever, don't you? Martha knows my voice. If she talked to you at all, she didn't tell you anything. Of that I am sure, so save your breath. There is no use your telling me she gave you any information. Oh, no, you got me wrong, pal. I only told you Martha called to let you know I know there is a Martha. I figured it might make you nervous, and nervous men are easy to beat. Other nervous men may be easy to beat, Dollar, but not James Yarbo. The police have tried, and they couldn't prove a thing against me. Now, may I have your permission to get up? Yeah. Maybe the police haven't been able to get anything on you, but I have something. Attempted murder. The hatchet you went for. <laughs> the pitiful mistake of a pitifully suspicious mind, Dollar. I wasn't reaching for that hatchet on the table. I was trying to show you something in the table drawer. There it is, spilled out on the floor. My wife's insurance policy. The one your unscrupulous, thieving superiors refused to pay. The vampires. Here, look at it. All in order. Much of it in fine print. Fine. Just fine. <laughs> okay, Yarbo, that did it. Come on, ahead of me. Uh, where are we going? To find some place to lock you up. I was hired to stop you, and until I do, I'm at least going to try and slow you down. Now move. Uh, Linen closet. No room here. Come on. Bathroom. No window. Yeah, this will do. Go on, get in there. No, 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 not in here. Anywhere but in here. It's a good place. You may get thirsty. No, no, no. This is where my wife died. Not in here. No. Which, on the surface, may seem to have been a move on the cruel side. But Yarbo was a man obviously off his rocker, and I needed him more nervous than I already had him. Too nervous to attempt killing any more people. Expense account item five, a nickel. Phone call, downtown office, state police. A Mr. and Mrs. Granville Morse had indeed crashed to their death on the great highway south of Seal Rock at 845, which made the lady with the early telephone news flash, Martha, a gal with whom I wanted an early date. <laughs> Hello? Uh, what is it? Hello, Mr. Coates. This is Dollar. Uh, oh, yes, Dollar. What do you want? Well, first I want to tell you that you just lost two more policyholders. List price, 80000 Oh, good Lord. This is terrible. Who, how, what... Never mind that. I've also got something else. On the good side, I need your help tonight. Uh, of course. Anything. What can I do? Meet me at your office. You and I are going to go looking for a dame named Martha. Martha? Martha who? I don't know but I hope she works for you. I'll be there in a half hour. Make that 20 minutes, and you'll be 10 minutes closer to happy days. The office personnel records of the West Coast underwriters turned up not one, but three employees named Martha, which gave me three choices as to who had been supplying Yarbo with a list of West Coast policy, insurance, policy holders. Finding the exact Martha was even easier. On the phone, she had told me that she was calling from the office. And the night elevator operator's in and out book showed the signature of one Martha Kinsey. And I just couldn't wait to hear her report. Who is it? I've got a message from Mr. Yarbo. Oh, just a minute. Message from James? Oh, what does he want? Well, what he really wants is to get out of the bathroom. That's where I've got him locked up. Who are you? You ought to know who I am. I assume you're the one that told Yarbo he could be expecting a call from an insurance investigator named Dollar. Well, that's me. Well, I don't care. James told me girls give out lists of names all the time. Sell them for mailing lists. Ten cents apiece. May not be ethical, but it's not against the law. James told me, and I believe James. Oh, he's the smartest man I ever knew. Well, he may be the smartest, but he's right in line to be numbered among the deadest. 
One of these fine mornings, the state is going to give him a cyanide egg for breakfast. What do you mean? You should know. Murder, execution, gas chamber. Well, you can't prove a thing. James told me so, and he knows. Well, he's smart. I hope he's not smart enough to pick a lock with a bath mat. Now, come on, sit down. You and I are going to have a nice, long talk. We are not. I won't say a thing. I don't have to, unless you have a warrant, an indictment, and a court reporter. James told me so. Yeah, I know. He's smart. But no matter what he told you, you're going to tell me a few things. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. So, I was wrong. Martha didn't tell me anything. But her stubborn attitude did. She was in love with Mr. Yarbo, a stupid middle-aged woman having her last fling at romance, doing her best to keep her last chance alive in the person of the man who had made her his partner in crime. As crazy as it was, this grotesque pair of lovebirds created the only real emotion in the case to date and switched my thoughts from the widely scattered deaths which had brought me into the case and over to the single death of Yarbo's wife, Enclosed, find a transcript of statement made to me at 2 o'clock in the morning by the doctor who signed Mrs. Yarbo's death certificate. Cause of death, cerebral hemorrhage, result of severe fracture of skull, region medulla oblongata, contributing factors, woman bathing in bathtub at home, slipped and fell, striking head on shower spigot. Coroner's finding death due to misadventure. Accidental. It took the doctor two minutes to get around to making that statement. I figured it would take Martha at least 30 minutes to get her hair out of her curlers and make herself presentable enough to risk being seen on the street. That left me 28 minutes to get back to Yarbo's house before she did, and I didn't need half that long. In the cab on my way over, I took inventory. One, to date, Yarbo's alibis covering him on all the so-called revenge murders had been perfect, too perfect. Second, when I first faced Yarbo, he screamed about his wife's death, not in the light of having lost his lady love, but in the light of having lost her insurance money. Just as my third and most important conclusion came upon me, the taxi came upon our destination, and I had to go to work. Once inside the little horror house on Lombard Street, I got set for a long search. But it turned out to be a short one, and it proved two things. Yarbo was not only a murderer, he was as crazy as he'd acted, and having kept the evidence around... Okay, Yarbo, come on out. Well, I hope you have enjoyed your waste of time, Mr. Dollar, as I've enjoyed my chance for meditation. You saw Martha, I suppose? Yes, I saw Martha. Bless her silent little soul. Yes, I was sure of Martha. She believes in me. Uh, you can say that again. Come on out here. Mr. Dollar, I suppose you are aware that this is the second time tonight you've been guilty of breaking and entering. I am, however, willing to forgive that should you come to your senses and decide to go back to Hartford and leave me alone. Uh-uh. Oh. Mm. Um, mind treading on the roses in the rug, Mr. Dollar? Sorry, Yarbo. I fell for that gag earlier tonight. People who smile at that joke give me the last laugh. Now, look, Yarbo, I know exactly what you've been up to, and I know why you've done it. But your little war of nerves has got to stop. It will never stop. No one can prove anything against me. I can. I can prove that you haven't done a thing to bring about those accidental deaths you've been taking credit for. Martha has sat down that insurance office, uh, office and notified you every time there's been an accidental death of a policyholder in this part of the country. Then you've written the company your little letters and gotten your little kicks out of it, right? That's a lie, lie, lie. This is a switch, a guy yelling that loud that he's guilty. You'll have to prove it. You will have to prove it. Don't worry, chum. I'm not going to waste a breath proving murders that you didn't commit. But, brother, I'm really going to go to town on the one that you did. Your wife, Mr. Yarbo. That is the most ridiculous statement you have yet made, young man. Look around you. Take note. I have profited by all the mistakes made by the original owners of these bloody souvenirs from Dr. Crippen on down. You will see in me the living composite of them all. And I intend to stay that way, alive. I'm afraid you will, but it's going to be inside an upholstered room. And this is what will put you there. Oh, God. Yeah, Mr. Yarbo, you carried your little hobby of crime souvenirs too far when you saved this hunk of pipe and the faucet with which you clubbed your wife to death. She slipped and fell. She was in the tub. I'm sure the police microscopes can give you a strong argument on that one. 
Now, come on. And let's make it easy on each other, shall we? No, no, I didn't do it. I, I didn't do it. Let go. Whoa. Let go of me. You, you have to fool me. Help me, Martha. Help me. Hit him with something. I'd have bet on myself against the two of them if I didn't have to fight while playing hopscotch over those roses in the carpet about which I still wasn't quite sure. It was touch and go. Martha would try to touch the back of my head with something, and I'd go. Do something, Martha! Do something! I'll fix him! I'll fix him! Something Martha tried to do was pick up a heavy-based urn and aim it at me. <sighs> she missed. It started to roll across the rosy carpet. When Yarbo saw where it was headed, he wrenched himself loose and dove the <laughs> carpet. I dove the other way. He got there just too late. <laughs> I didn't have to look twice to know he was dead. Fate had called James Yarbo up on his own carpet. When Martha threw that urn at me, it had rolled straight for the only rose in the rug that had been booby traps. Which only goes to prove that sometimes a rose by any other name can be anything but sweet. Expense account, item six. A dollar and 40 cents. Three month subscription, Love Life magazine. Sent to accessory to murder, Martha Kinsey. To Hatchaby State Prison. I figured three months was about all she had. The judges and juries in California being rather efficient that way. Expense account, uh, item seven. Six bucks. Dinner and diving for pearls in a barrel of blue points at Fisherman's Wharf. Diving for Pearl's earring, which she lost while bending over the barrel trying to see what oysters looked like. Uh, item eight, $176.87. Airfare, San Francisco to Hartford. Uh, expense account total, $942.08. Not including defense lawyer fees if you decide to sue me for not being able to add correctly. Signed, yours, uh... Truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Jay Novello, Martha Wentworth, Paul Dubois, Gigi Pearson, and Larry Dobkin. The special music is written and conducted by Wilbur Hatt. Be sure to be with us at this same time next week when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Everyone is concerned about world affairs these days. If we want world peace, we'll have to have national peace first. In order to keep America's strength and prestige, in order to preserve her freedom, we must do away with group prejudice. Let's stop judging people by the color of their skin or the place where they worship and start considering them for what they do. We'll be sure to have a happier world. Stay tuned now for Vaughn Monroe and his caravan, following immediately on most of these PBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.